So you're ready to upgrade your GPU for Blender, but you don't know which one is the right one for you. Bigger isn't always better, price doesn't always match performance, and there are hidden pitfalls that can trip you up. And in this video, we'll go through exactly what you need to consider when picking up your perfect GPU for your workflow. I'm Mike, your creative tech chap. Let's get into it. Whether you're working with cycles or EV rendering, sculpting massive meshes or building complex geometry node setups, the GPU you choose does matter. But not every expensive GPU is the right choice. And sometimes a mid-range card handles your needs perfectly. Today, I'm gonna to cover 10 essential factors you need to look at before buying. We'll have a look at the physical fit, power requirements, VRAM needs, compatibility with Blender 5, and future-proofing, more on that later. By the end, I hope you'll be armed with the knowledge you need to find that GPU that matches your needs. Now, before we get into performance benchmarks and specifications, let's start with something really simple a lot of people overlook all the time. Will the GPU even fit in your case? GPUs come in all shapes and sizes, and some manufacturers make them unnecessarily large. I presume because people assume bigger means faster, but that's not always true. A compact two-slot card, something like this, can absolutely outperform a massive one. Here's what to check. Grab a tape measure, you'll need to go and measure three things. First of all, if you don't currently have a GPU, you'll need to find the top PCI 16 slot, and that's where your GPU will go. If you've already got one, of course, you can just see where it is. Now, first of all, measure the length from the back of the case. That's where this panel goes on the back, where the ports are that you'll plug in your monitors, and you'll need to make sure that your case actually fits lengthwise. It's quite often that you'll get drive cages that may prevent longer cards from fitting. The width of the card is also important. So when you plug it in, some cases aren't that wide, but also we have cable clearance to consider. So we wanna make sure that we can plug in the power cable here without putting too much stress on it. You'll need some wiggle room as well. If the dimensions are an exact match, it likely won't fit at all. I've had that issue myself where the card was the right size, but you had to kind of maneuver it in and it just wouldn't fit otherwise. And finally, the height of the card. So the thickness, if you will. Some modern GPUs take up two, three, even four expansion slots, which might block other ports on your motherboard. So make sure you don't need any of these. Now, have you ever bought a GPU that didn't fit? Let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear about those stories. Next, let's talk about budget, because this is where things get really interesting. It's tempting to grab the most powerful GPU you can afford, but the overkill here is real. You can very easily end up overspending. If you're mainly doing things like stylized rendering with a moderate poly count and let's say 2K textures, a top tier GPU won't give you a proportionally better experience using Blender or better results than a well-chosen mid-range card, potentially saving you hundreds or even thousands of dollars. Think about your actual workflow. Are you rendering photorealistic architectural visualizations with 8K textures and complex lighting? Then yes, invest more, especially if that's your business and you're making money from it. But if you're creating things for fun or perhaps just creating some low poly game assets, simple animation work or stylized art, you can absolutely get professional results with a three to $500 card. What is available right now to us is so much faster than we had even 10 years ago. You really cannot use hardware limitations as an excuse anymore. Now the sweet spot for most Blender users in 2025 is actually a mid-tier NVIDIA RTX card, something like a 5060, 5070 or 5070 Ti. That's getting a bit expensive at that point. You get the optics acceleration, which is the ray tracing support, which is absolutely phenomenal for cycles rendering. And you often get enough VRAM, 16 gigabytes in the 5060 Ti and the 5070 Ti variants for most projects without having to break the bank. And I've had loads of questions over the past few months about hardware for Blender. And that's why I'm making this guide for you, the everyday Blender user, to help you upgrade without having any nasty surprises. If you're enjoying the breakdown so far, please remember to hit that like button. It really does help the channel out. Not all GPUs play well with Blender. If Blender is something that you mess around with once in a while, this matters a bit less. But if your main focus is on Blender, it can make a substantial difference. Love them or hate them, Nvidia GPUs dominate when it comes to Blender support. 
They have CUDA and optics acceleration built in, and optics in particular is incredibly fast when it comes to cycles rendering. We're talking significantly faster render times compared to standard CUDA and way ahead of CPU rendering and the other GPUs. AMD has made huge strides with their HIP implementation. If you're on a budget, AMD cards can offer excellent value, especially their older RX 7000 series. But Nvidia still has the edge in features and optimization. And for reference, their latest 9070 XT is about the same speed as a 3080. So a couple of generations ago Nvidia card, but it does have more VRAM. Intel is also in the game now with their Arc GPUs. They're still maturing and you're going to have to check Blender's compatibility list before committing to those. There is always a risk with new hardware that not everything works as well as you might hope. There is a great channel, by the way, that has looked at Intel and AMD cards. They're called Contradiction Tech. I'll pop a link below for you to explore later. And here's something important from my testing. What Blender uses the GPU for versus the CPU matters for making your purchasing decision. The GPU primarily handles rendering, cycles especially, but also the EV view port and material preview. But simulations, fluid, smoke, fire, those are all going to be CPU bound, unless you're using a different bit of software. Geometry data when sculpting, that can be really RAM intensive, both on the GPU and your main system RAM. Understanding this helps you avoid overspending on your GPU when your workflow is primarily CPU limited. VRAM or video memory is one of the most misunderstood aspects of GPU selection. How much do you actually need? Well, first of all, stop using those 4K textures for absolutely everything. That eats up memory very quickly and in the majority of cases is not going to make a quality difference. Keeping your pixels and texels closely matched is really important. And there's a deep dive coming on that soon. So subscribe and hit the bell so you know when it's here. For most Blender users, eight gigabytes is enough, really. If you're doing stylized work, product visualization, or animation with moderate scene complexity, eight gigabytes is gonna handle it absolutely fine. But here is where it gets interesting. Textures don't just eat up your VRAM, they eat up RAM too. There was a time when I thought that RAM or VRAM, but it is actually both. When you load a 4K texture, it sits there in the system's memory and then gets loaded into your graphics card's VRAM for rendering. This means that if you're working on a massive library of textures, you need to think about your system RAM alongside that VRAM. Now, typically you'll probably want 12 gigabytes or more if you're working with large scene files, high resolution textures, 4K ones, especially 8K as well. But typically I would leave those ones for an HDRI around your scene. You probably don't need an 8 K texture unless it's a texture atlas. Geometry data, on the other hand, is primarily RAM heavy. When I'm sculpting high res or have had a liberal use of the subdivision surface modifier, that's poor resource use on my part. Too much geometry can bring Blender to an unusable crawl. And that's a CPU and RAM bottleneck, not just the GPU. So think about your actual scenes. Track how much RAM you are actually using. Task Manager is usually better rather than Blender's tools as they're not that accurate. Have you ever run out of VRAM mid-project? I have, it's really annoying. Drop your experience in the comments. Oh, and before we move on, if we have a look at Apple Silicon, they have a different memory structure. I think it's up to 75% of the available memory on the system because it's unified memory you can use on your GPU. So if you have a 16 gigabyte laptop, say a MacBook Pro, then you'll have up to 12 gigabytes that you can use for the GPU, which is fantastic. But if you've got something like a 64 gigabyte one, suddenly you've got 48 gigabytes of VRAM available to you. Absolutely phenomenal having that unified system. If you want faster render times, you need to look for cards optimized for ray tracing and CUDA or optics acceleration. But don't get caught up on just the rendering time. You can always leave something to render overnight or on another machine. I often do that last one all the time with animations. This is where Nvidia really shines. Optics rendering in cycles is incredibly fast just compared to CUDA and both are miles ahead of CPU rendering. The main issue with the GPU render is that your scene, if it doesn't fit into that VRAM on your GPU, it might fail. But these days it often slows down, sometimes even slower than just using your CPU in the first place. 
Spending a few moments thinking about optimization can mean you don't need an upgrade of your hardware at all. Here's the thing though. Rendering is where the GPU does matter the most. When you're adjusting lights in a scene, when you're playing around with your materials and trying to get them just right. And of course, rendering animations all benefit massively. But geometry animation itself, as an example, the movement of the objects and deformation, that's still primarily CPU handled. So faster rendering doesn't necessarily mean faster animation playback in the viewport. A powerful GPU is completely useless if your power supply can't handle it or your case turns into an oven. So let's talk about the practical requirements. First of all, wattage, the power that your GPU is going to consume. Modern high-end GPUs can pull three to 600 watts under full load. So check your power supply's total wattage and make sure you have enough headroom. A good rule of thumb is your PSU should be rated for at least 150 watts more than your total system draw, so not just that GPU. Second, the connectors. Some GPUs need multiple eight pin power cables. Make sure your PSU actually has enough connectors and they're not chained together. You want separate cables for safety and stability. Third, cooling and airflow. Does your case have a good intake and exhaust? Most GPUs will dump heat into the case. And if that heat has nowhere to go, everything throttles and performance will tank. Now you can get blower style GPUs and these would exhaust air out the back of the case instead, but they often come at the cost of additional noise. Now ignoring these can mean overheating, system crashing, or even hardware failure in the extreme cases. I've seen GPUs throttle so hard they performed worse than older cards simply because the case airflow was inadequate. And this, along with power limits, is why laptops with the same named GPU cannot be directly compared to their desktop counterparts. Not to mention they often have a different VRAM amount as well. Check your current PSU specs before buying. Trust me on this one. If you're going to have to buy another one, buy a good one. It's literally the heart of your PC. Your motherboard and GPU need to speak the same language. And that's PCIe. This slot just here. Now, Here's the quick version. Think of PCIe lanes like lanes on a motorway or highway. Older PCI Gen 3 slots have slower bandwidth, newer Gen 4 or 5, they have double each time than the one before. But here's the good news. GPUs are backwards compatible. A PCI Gen 4 or Gen 5 will work fine in a Gen 3 slot, you'll just get slightly less bandwidth. And unlike gaming, it doesn't require back and forth all the time. Do you want to check your system settings right now? There are a couple of ways of doing this. Let's launch Task Manager and get some information. So when you open up Task Manager, you can use Control, Shift and Escape to open that up. If we go to the Performance tab, if that's not there, you might need to click this little three lines at the top. Uh, performance, you can have a look at the CPU itself. You can see what specification you have. You've got your memory as well. And here we can see I've got 126. No, I've got 128 gigabytes of RAM on my computer. And then the next important thing is the GPU itself. Now we can see that it's on PCI bus one, which means that it's going to be plugged into the top socket, but that doesn't give us any more information about that. But we can see our dedicated memory as well, if you find that useful. And because my CPU also has an integrated GPU, huh, that's where my two gigs has gone from my RAM. I don't actually need that, so I might disable that later. However, if you want a bit more information on a Windows PC about the graphics card and what it's actually plugged into at the moment, so you don't have to look at your motherboard specs, go get yourself GPU-Z. Uh, this is a great little tool for analyzing your GPU and giving you a ton of information, quite technical information. However, it has all of the information here about my GPU. The area I'm interested in is bus interface. We can see here we're PCIe times 16, which is good. It's a big slot and Gen 5. Let's be honest, GPUs don't age gracefully. But if you want something that won't feel outdated too soon, here's what to consider. And remember, FOMO is a real thing and often it might not align with your goals in Blender. First of all, ray tracing optic support is important. More Blender features are leveraging hardware ray tracing and it's only gonna grow. Now, one thing to bear in mind is Nvidia's DLSS and frame gen do nothing in Blender. Same goes for FSR and XESS, and I doubt they will for a while or at all. For the moment, they are gaming centric and media centric features. Enough VRAM for future projects. If you're on the edge with eight gigs now, 
you'll be limited in a year or two. Consider at least 12 if you plan to keep this card for a while. There are both 5060 Ti and 5070 Ti that both have 16 gigabytes, and they're around 400 pounds and 700 pounds here in the UK, and they haven't been affected for the moment by the memory price increase. And for Blender specifically, CUDA and Optics support matter for longevity. Blender's Cycles renderer is deeply integrated with NVIDIA's frameworks, especially optics for ray tracing, which means NVIDIA features often arrive first and receive more optimization attention. And while AMD's HIP support has improved in recent releases, NVIDIA still tends to get the priority for cutting edge rendering features. Apple Silicon, as I mentioned before, is a great choice. I regularly use my base model M1 Pro, MacBook Pro. It's only got 16 gigabytes as well. And that, if you go on the charts, my PC is at least 34 times faster. But honestly, it really doesn't feel like that unless I'm doing some heavy cycles render or material exploration. Blender rendering is compute heavy, meaning a good GPU feels relevant for longer versus just using a card for gaming where it can feel out of date quicker as games demand newer features. Quick one for you, if you run multiple displays, check the GPU's output options. Most modern GPUs support at least four screens through DisplayPort and HDMI outputs. Now this is usually one HDMI port and three DisplayPort ports for licensing reasons or something along those lines. But if you need more, you can always use display link adapters or even add a second GPU just for display output. I learned this the hard way with my MacBook Pro's weird display limitations, but that's a story for another day. Just count your monitors and verify the GPU has enough of the correct ports. Simple. And sometimes you'll need a different cable or a display port to HDMI cable or an adapter or something like that. Parkinson's law states that a task will expand to fill the time given. The same is true with better hardware. If you're already used to a rendering taking five minutes, it's quite likely you will just increase the quality to match that time again on better hardware. Not everyone can upgrade their GPU straight away, and honestly, you might not need to. Let's share some optimizations that can squeeze more performance out of what you already have. First, understand not every bottleneck is GPU related. As we've mentioned, simulations, smoke, water, and fire, those are CPU calculations. For the video sequence editor, that uses CPU decoding and which requires proxies, which takes time and isn't currently, I hope they sort it out soon, GPU accelerated at all. If these are your main workflows, a GPU upgrade won't help much. Second, optimize your scenes. Reduce texture resolution where it doesn't impact the final quality. Use instances instead of duplicating geometry and simplify your lighting setups. And please, stop rendering a 4K post to social media. Third, use adaptive sampling and denoising in cycles. This can cut render time in half without quality loss. And finally, Consider using render farms for heavy projects or perhaps a friend's computer instead of buying expensive hardware that sits idle most of the time. These optimizations can dramatically improve your workflow without spending a penny on new hardware and even help on high-end hardware as well. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this has helped you out with your GPU decisions. For more on optimization tips, check out this video right here.